Hello, hello. This is Silas here. I'm here with my friend Stephen. What's up? Hello, everybody. We're back for our back for the second time, kind of. <laughs> this is some behind the scenes stuff, but we just had a little uh, snafu or snafu. It's a snafu term, yes. Snafu, <laughs> yeah. The initial recording, but this is starting a new part of our conversation series. We've had one on uh, you are what you consume, and the premise of that one was humans are more than your physical self. So it's not just the calories you take in that build up the proteins and fats. And uh, what's the other one? Proteins, fats, carbohydrates. carbohydrates that build up your body and power your body. But it's also what are the actual ideas that you take in the ideas, information, emotions, feelings. I think those kind of build up more of our mental selves, which kind of differentiates us from many of the other life forms, especially differentiates us from things like rocks and things like that. Because a rock takes in actual content, like your human body, and builds up its rockness, but it doesn't take in the thoughts and ideas. So that was that series. Then we did the 1619 Project, right? And mm -hmm. um, that one was with Phil Magnus, and uh, that's also who's part of what we're going to be talking about now. That one is more about the reimagining of the history of the United States of America. Now, that's also part of what, what did the United States of America consume as a nation? And the premise of that was when the first slaves came across the transatlantic slave trade, that created the United States of America. And that makes the United States of America means it was a racist country, is a racist country, and always will be. And supposedly, somehow, if you follow some of the things that they're saying, maybe you can cure yourself of that racism. And then the next one was uh, critical theory, but it was focusing through the lens or we're filtering it through the book, Cynical Theories, and Stephen was kind of walking us through that, and we divided that into different sections and talked about that. And some of what was in that will highly inform this current series, and this series is going to be about education, specifically through the book Cracks in the Ivory Tower, the moral mess of... Um, the moral mess of higher education, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And that is by who? Tell us a little bit about the authors and the book and why why this book. Sure. So the two authors, their names are Phil Magnus and Jason Brennan. As Silas just mentioned, Magnus wrote that very good critique of the 1619 Project, which we did another video series on if you're interested in that. His background is that he's an economic historian, mostly focusing on America in the 19th century. He currently works as a research fellow at the Inst American Institute for Economic Research. That's in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Jeffrey Tucker and a few other prominent libertarians work there as well. He holds a BA in political science from the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. He obtained his master's and PhD from George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. He taught at Berry College, George Mason University, and American University in the Washington, D.C. region. J uh, Phil Magnus, really good guy. I'm friends with him on Facebook. I share a lot of his posts. He has a lot of good commentary just in general, aside from his writings. Good comments. He has a spat with Nicole Hannah-Jones that's been going on. I find pretty funny and <laughs> entertaining <laughs> to watch. So Jason Brennan is currently the Robert J. and Elizabeth Flanagan Family Professor of Strategy, Economics, Ethics, and Public Policy at McDonough. Uh, how, how were you saying that? McDonough. It's McDonough. McDonough. McDonough, McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University. He writes about democratic theory, the ethics of voting, competence and power, freedom, moral foundation of commercial society. He focuses on the intersection of normative political philosophy and empirical social sciences, especially on questions about voter behavior, pathologies of democracy, and the consequences of freedom. He argues that most moral, that most citizens have a moral obligation not to vote. He attended Case Western Reserve University and the University of New Hampshire as an undergrad. He got his PhD in philosophy at the University of Arizona. Jason Brennan, I added recently on Facebook as well. He's another one pretty – I like a lot of his commentary on issues as well as his writings. Yeah. And um, so <laughs> give me some beats that we go up to. We just recorded like an hour of this. And we found out there's some issue with the recording and the connection. And that was probably mostly on, on my actual aspect. But hey, you live and you learn. And that's what we're talking about in this mm -hmm. series. You experience certain things and you learn from them. It will come up later. So we'll just talk about Georgetown University came up. We were wondering, is that an Ivy League university? Is it Ivy League? Is it not? It's not Ivy League. The Ivy Leagues are Brown, Columbia, Cornell, Dartmouth, Harvard, University of Pennsylvania, Princeton, and Yale. But um, 
Georgetown is up there. It's only mentioned in that same kind of group and things like that. And that's what we're focusing on here. What is the importance of these actual universities? Why should we actually go learn at these locations? Why these locations versus the myriad of other ways that you could possibly learn? And I think we'll give you a little background of our educational uh, backgrounds for what it matters, because these things do matter to some people, even though we're going to make the case that it shouldn't matter if you're actually just talking about content. Content should be content. Information should be information. Like when I get information from the computer, the computer hasn't had a lived experience of anything. It's just the computer giving me information. Like the data and the information it gives me is either right or wrong. Sure. for me, my background was, was in France. Uh, I went to a kindergarten. This, I don't know if it's a very council education thing. It was uh, Marymount Academy. It's a Montessori, in the Montessori school type of system. And then I went to, I moved to Kenya and I went to St. Nicholas, which was a Christian school, Catholic school, a lot of Catholic schools in, I should say, in, in, in Africa, sorry, Kenya, Anglican schools, a lot of Christian schools. Then I went to uh, a, a Catholic uh, consulate school that was the, 844 system, which is carried over from the United Kingdom. So it's eight years, standard one to eight, then standard uh, eight to 10. Then you go to university. I don't think it was standard 12. I could double, I'll double check that. But that was a British system based off of that. Then I went to the United States of America for middle school and high school and my undergraduate in a school in West Virginia. And then I finished off in Rome, Italy at an American university there. Majority of the people at the school were uh, people who were just coming for semester abroad. So they had a very it's a much smaller school with a few people that were four year students there. And then I had a post grad course for focusing just on animation at the Institute of European Design in Turin, Italy. So that's my educational background. And then from then, it's just been a lot of self taught and self learning and things like that. Oh, one more thing. I also taught at a university here in Kenya, one of the top universities. and. That, that's what's going to inform when it comes to actual direct interaction with various educational systems. That's what's going to inform some of my thoughts. And then the rest will just be general observations and uh, things. Uh, yourself? My, my education is very simple and straightforward. I went to Millbrook K through 12. That's a school here upstate. Hated much of it. I'll probably get into that more as the discussion goes on. Love learning, <laughs> lo- love learning though. And then as far as college, my only formal education is Culinary Institute of America Associates. I graduated in 2009. So I haven't spent much time in academia. So I am looking at this, I will admit, from kind of a layman's perspective. But I think a lot of the research here is very well done, very well articulated, very rigorous in its methodology. And I think hopefully some of the people listening here might hear this. And I think certain things will resonate with them because as we, Silas and I discussed earlier, I find that even, even people who have spent a lot of time in school, I'm not finding a lot of people who said college was worth what they paid or it was worth every penny or it made them who they are or that. There's there are a lot of criticisms in here that I think many people would be at least sympathetic to, if not outright agree with. So I think it's important to have these sorts of discussions and shine some light on these issues. Yeah. And as, as we continue this conversation, we'll, we'll start talking about certain things. But there's, there's that temptation to say, oh, you haven't been to the school that I've been to. You haven't been in the education system. That's why you don't like it. Or making these caricatures of the people inside the system and the people outside. And that's actually one of the first chapters, if not the first chapter, from remembering right yes. about this, about the framing of this thing. And this is something I talk to Stephen from this thing again. If I turn around like this and then you see the back of my head like that, like literally physically the back of my head has been on my mind for my whole life. But from you just looking at the back of my head like that there, you probably have a better description. You'd probably be able to better describe what the back of my head looks like than I can because I've never I don't actually see it. By me being under it, by it being something that I'm within it's can it can reduce my ability to accurately observe or to give a good observation of it. So there could be that kind of thing happening with the educational system. Most people, I think, want to do things that are good. They're participating in things, and this just comes back with the next conversation we're going to get into with uh, human action by Mises. We're just talking about with praxeology. It's people deciding between improving the status, picking the best possible thing to do at that time from a range of things. So someone who's decided to be a teacher is doing that for positive reasons. 
Now, some might be more selfish, but this whole idea that there's an altruistic class of people where it's like, oh, we we have this beautiful system where everybody just really cares about everyone and it's kumbaya. No, that's that's not the kind of not even human being. That's not the kind of life form yeah. that we are aware of existing. Yeah. <laughs> like, that is not what existence is. That is not natural. That would be actually very unnatural. That kind of being would evolve itself out of existence yeah. if it was completely altruistic and it didn't have its personal needs. And I just have this one thought. It's it's one of the things most selfish, I think more selfish than thinking everybody should care about you as much as they care about themselves is demanding they be forced to do this. And that is part of, I think, the main focus that we're talking about here with the educational system. And um, I wanted to go in and look to see the number of schools. Asking you guys out there, you guys and gals and whatever's in the middle, how many schools do you think are in the United States of America? Because this will be focusing, it'll be very central to the United States of America. But as we discussed, uh, I think you'd agree, a lot of other systems in other countries have adopted the United States of America system, right? And they do so because they look at the success of the United States of America and think, we want to do that too, so let's adopt some of the things. The system of the United States of America has constantly been like, we, it's all about the kids, it's all about the teachers, we need to spend yeah. more on education. It's a constant thing in politics, and we might get into more details of how yes. much it actually goes into that. But this 6,606 post-secondary Title IX institutions, degree-granting institutions is 4,360. That's broken up into, um, into two two-year colleges and four-year colleges. And when you talk about the K through 12, which is kindergarten through uh, uh, senior year in, uh, in high school, that's 9,874. So nine thousand eight hundred. Sorry, ninety-eight thousand one hundred and fifty-eight. <laughs> Did do too well math when I was in class there. <laughs> no, that's reading. That's reading. Reading comprehension. So those are the kind of schools that we're focusing on. That was two thousand and sixteen numbers. So those are the schools that are the basis of what's happening in this. And one question about this content. This is a book, of course, that was released pre-pandemic. Um, is it, has there been any talk by any of the authors of doing some kind of follow-up or some kind of addendum or some kind of addition in in lieu or in mind taking into account what the pandemic is doing and will do to the education landscape vis-a-vis -vis what they've written in this book? Well, I, I just wanted to bring up a few points on that. So this book is is meant to be non-ideological. The authors, of course, have their own views, but they wanted to write a book that anyone could read. So... People like Silas and I will criticize the ideologies taught in academia. That's not the point. This is just to focus on a big, bigger picture view and say, OK, these are problems as far as incentives and rules that the institutions have, which set the incentives, which influence the behavior. Now, as far as a follow up to this, the authors have talked about some of these issues on Facebook about people realizing now, wait a minute, we're paying for this tuition and we're doing classes remotely. Why bother if we can just learn this stuff remotely anyway? So on their own Facebook pages, they've been saying things. They haven't said anything about a follow-up as far as writing another book or anything. They were going to write another book about talking about the ideologies in academia and how and why those are toxic. And of course, we talked about that in the last video series. But it's mostly just been a little commentary on Facebook with this. I think, you know, again, they obviously have their own views on it. I don't know that they were going to write a follow-up piece. This book was written towards the end of last year, so this pandemic wasn't really even on the horizon yet. So. Okay. Because yeah. to me, that's that's one of the positive things that I think will come out of this. Things just happen. Like yeah. the pandemic has happened. It's something that we're dealing with, something we will be dealing with for the rest of, for the foreseeable future. Now, one of the positives I think is now raising the question mark about the educational system. There's a lot of things that have been going on due to momentum that now that the world has taken a pause and doesn't do this whole, I think it's what, it's called factory schooling. This, yeah. Somebody else posted a quote where they say, oh, people are talking about how homeschooling and remote learning has failed because of what's happening during the pandemic. When you actually look at history and homeschooling is what things mostly were done for 99 yeah. percent majority of human history, majority of humans still today 
still go through regular homeschooling or apprenticeships or other ways. They don't actually go to an institution and a location and sit down and learn from teachers in that general structure that we think of when we think of the brick and mortar schools. But a lot of people were so invested in that idea that that is how success came. You had mentioned something with your grandmother, how that's, um, that's from back then, the systems are still the same, right? Like, uh, what was it you'd mentioned? Well, so what I, what I said was my grandmother, she's 98. She was born in 1922. And I was trying to make the point of think about how much the world has changed since she was born. She, she, when she was born, there were Model Ts. Air conditioning was in like the very, very early stages. Obviously, no TVs yet. People listen to ham radios with terrible quality, all that. And think about that era she was born in versus now and how much things have changed, but school has essentially stayed the same. If you think about it, this, the structure is the same. The only real additions are special education and technology. So schools have computers and things. But aside from that, the basic structure is the same. And something I'm always personally critical of is that so-called progressives are always big on saying things like, oh, we don't like the status quo. We can't hold on to this. The Constitution is an outdated document, all this. But somehow with the school system, they have this dogmatic insistence that things stay as they are. And it's a little unclear to me why that is, because if, if you're willing to upend all this other stuff, OK, we can have those discussions. But why does school have to stay the same as it's been from the 1830s? It's it's almost a 200 year old system. I don't really see the case for that. And in fact, I see the case for much of the opposite. At least, well, I guess the way I should put it is not tear down the system, but at least allow for alternatives and allow ways in which the system could be changed or even there would there would be no system. There would just be lots of little systems all working to do what the current system is doing. Yeah. And what is the purpose of school? What do you consider yeah. the purpose of school to be? What do you consider the person, purpose of education to be? Yeah. What Stephen and I here advocate for, what we participate in, what we value, I think, in each other's friendship and in this conversation series that we continue in, is taking information and communicating it to somebody else to the point that they can understand, intake that, and then do something with it. Just like the simple thing where you, you get you get the foodstuffs out of the ground, you cook them up, you chef them up, you put the spices, you serve it on the on the plate in a certain way, in a certain environment, somebody gets enriched from it, takes it into their body and comes. That process is what we're talking about. The conversion of certain and certain ideas to somebody else or telling them about those ideas, conveying them to them, and then having them intake that and then be able to actually do something productive with that, to be a better person from that. And that will help everybody else. I think it's in and of itself, teaching itself kind of gives you, I think, I don't know if this is, this, this might be something, there might be many things involved in society that we'll talk about later on, let me not get to that right now, about this the interaction that people have, just the feeling of being able to actually teach someone something is, is a magnificent thing in and of itself. And I experience that as a teacher officially in the school, but just even when I have a conversation with Stephen, he tells you something, you learn that, or you I tell something to you and he seems to get it or just anyone else. I think that's a good feeling in and of itself. So that is, I think, the thing that we're saying with the current systems the way they are. The actual conveyance of information in this information age, in this understanding age, age of understanding, and you're seeing the effect that technology and all that has had on so many other not directly information-related fields. And to have this effect where it seems to just be doing nothing in the field that's supposedly focused on conveying information is a shame. Like they, there's something wrong. There's something that's standing between that. So we're doing this in, in hopes that there's actually better ways of doing the thing that I think everybody, most of the people, 95% of the people involved in the education system, I would be confident to say, are doing it because they actually value people who don't know certain information to learn new information. Now I think we'll start discussing what is the information they consider valuable and all those things. And that's when you get into the whole, into the whole system. But yeah. And just one thing I wanted to touch on as well is uh, like, like I mentioned briefly, I, I did not have a good experience in school for a number of reasons, some of which I may get into in here as well. And now people could hear that and think, okay, you just have an ax to grind, so you're attacking the school system because you had a bad experience. That is a fair criticism. Obviously, there, are, there may be reasons I'm drawn to this material. But what I, what I mentioned to Silas earlier, and I'll sort of restate here, is that it, it works both ways. If I had a bad experience, does that mean the entire system is terrible? No. But at the same time, 
I know a few people will say, I had a great time in school. Okay, I mean, I'm glad they did, but that doesn't mean the system's great for everybody. And it's not fair to say, oh, I had a good experience. I learned a lot. And then just say, okay, that's the, that, that means it's great for everyone. Keep things as they are. When, again, you can point in the opposite direction. I can find a lot of people who have said, no, I paid way too much for school. Learning was overpriced. There, I didn't use a lot of what I learned on the job. I forgot a lot of what I was taught, all that. These are pretty common criticisms that I've found. I'm sure many of you have probably heard similar things. As far as my culinary experience, I had a great time there. I've, I've emphasized that several times, but my criticisms would be things like how much did it cost? How much does it matter now? Because more and more people have culinary degrees and also the lower standards. I mean, we had we had teachers there telling us, oh, a lot of people here shouldn't be graduating. What does that tell you? If teachers themselves are saying that, what does that say about the integrity of the institution? And again, I'll try to tie my experience into certain things I'm talking about here. But I, I think at very least, these are questions worth asking. I don't think there's any harm in questioning the status quo, even even if you do like the status quo. At least these are valid questions that should be asked. Yeah. And we're not saying any of our negative actual lived experiences are definitive. We're no, adding them no. to what's happening in here. Just like if I said, oh, I had a great time because I played football, doesn't mean anyone who objects to having uh, public schools have the have schools, I'm sorry, have sports teams and things like that be central to the schooling system because they say that's not education. That's ex extra, it's even called extracurricular activities. Yeah. So some people would say, oh, we should have extracurricular activities out instead. Like, oh, why should we have sports and then not have arts? Like we should have one or the other. Oh, let's have none of them. I've had a good experience being in, co in school, uh, both in college and uh, undergrad and, and, and um, K through 12 of playing sports, organized sports, and being in art. And I know some universities did have them. I was an art teacher here in um, in Kenya, and that's when I really got the first, you know, come to Mises moment, I like to call it, because it's not necessarily come to Jesus, because it, it led me towards looking at economics and the field of economics in general, which is just the way humans interact and make decisions. So that's more praxeology in specific. Mm -hmm. So it's not just finances, not just market economy. It's not just that. It's everything. Yeah. Me and Stephen made the decision when we figured out that uh, it hadn't been recording for some whatever reasons. We decided, okay, we can economize our times in different ways and start recording again or just keep going and pretend that didn't happen or cut this down or wait another day and come back. But no, we decided in an economical way to come back and continue this recording and restart from the start. So that kind of thing happened yeah. because I was looking at the environment that the kids here were going through and projecting my schooling environment onto them to think of how I would teach them. Yeah. And then went back and looked at the schools I went to and I realized there's <laughs> really top flight schools. I talked about those um, 98,000 uh, schools, K through 12. The school I went to for high school was in the top 25. It's, it still is, I think, in the top 50 public schools in the United States of America, making it probably in the top 1,000 schools or no, maybe not top 1,000. It could be top 1,000, maybe the top 10,000 schools in the world. So that's the environment I was going through and then projecting that onto other people. Yet, just because you had a good experience, just because you're a great teacher right now, just because you're doing your best – doesn't mean that's the same for everybody else. And then on the inverse that I think we'll discuss when we talk about the first chapter here is that's also not the way that this, just because you found one negative person means everybody in that environment is as negative as this one person right. or is as, as terrible as that person. So that's what we're, we're trying to just talk about something that's actually just describing what's going on. And I think that's the focus of this book, right? Yes. Well, I was I was going to also mention that I would sort of analogize this to workplaces. Like there are certain workplaces that I loved working that other people hated and vice versa. But we can't say it was a good place to work or it was a bad place to work because we had different experience. I was like there were places that I enjoyed working in that other people walked out of. There was one place I was miserable that other people said was a great place to work. It, it depends on the individual. It depends on your position. It depends what you're looking to get out of it. it depends on relationship with these bosses, all these other things. So my argument, too, would be that if we view this as we don't have to keep school the same way, let's try lots of different things. We could find different learning styles and different institutions that would be set up for different people. And long run, everyone would benefit from that. People would be better educated across the board, and then that would lead to a more productive, healthy civilization. And 
I, I think we need to at least ask these questions to head in that direction. Again, if you had a great experience, I'm, I'm glad you did. I don't wish misery on people, but I think we should at least ask these questions because there are serious problems here. And I, I think the authors certainly make a case for why that is. Yeah, and uh, that's that's the thing with with now getting to this point. I've had I have some some ideas of different yeah. ways, forms of learning, both that I that I've thought of mm. of when I was teaching, and also after I was teaching, or things to do in the future when I launch a studio to get people into it. Also, ways to think of in actual animes and actual video games and creations and stories that I have, different schooling systems in there. So there's many different ways of looking at things, but the momentum that has been going on pre-pandemic, which is what we're going to be focusing on mostly in this book, mm -hmm. has been stopped. And I think now a lot of new things are being tried. And people are trying to attempt to throw the baby out of the bathwater in this kind of situation to be like, oh, the, their homeschooling has failed. These things have failed. But what are you comparing it to? First of all, you're comparing it to a limited thing. Kids didn't understand that we're going to be in this. They've already been indoctrinated into thinking this way is positive. The current homeschooling and remote learning that people are talking about are things that are trying to shoehorn that it, factory type of learning, they're trying yeah. to organize and demand and it has to be taught in this kind of way. So you're not comparing something that is fair. You're not comparing different creatures. You're comparing a mutated creature of this older system that's trying to still shoehorn that thing, that whole system into this box. Trying to be like, oh, we still have to limit people from involving, or we, we, we still have to have this mentality where we have physical control over the kids. Like, when I was in school here in Kenya, it was, you'd be in one classroom and the teachers would move around. Mm. Yet in the United States of America, I got there and it was like, you'd move around the entire building. Mm. That alone itself puts kids in different mentalities to actually involve, like even, even a simple change like that is going to affect people in different ways. Somebody says, oh, like, oh, we need, we need the in-person attention. I had a great time in school. My, my teacher was, 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 was great to me. I mean, I always talked to the teacher. But if you're in class for 60 minutes and you're so excited because you had 15 minutes of your teacher's attention, that was 15 minutes less everybody else had in that class. Yeah. So yeah. possibly because you were getting 15 minutes and it made your experience great, some other kid didn't have any of those 15 minutes and that made their experience negative. Yeah. So there's many things to kind of think about when you're looking at this. So that's things that I think they talk about in this book and that's things mm -hmm. that I think you should keep in mind when we talk about certain personal experience and observations that we're going to have in this. Anything else? That's all. I was ready, ready to get right in. Okay. So as we get in, uh, we will be breaking this up into different sections, into the different chapters, and I'm going to read you the chapters. And then this interesting thing that we found out previously <laughs> when I was going through this, so I was asking him what the, what's the chapter list going to be because Stephen suggested we're going to break it up into the different chapters. It's 11 chapters. So there's going to be this intro, and we're going to be talking about the first chapter together in this video of the intro. And then there's going to be 10 more and then a, another video for the conclusion. So that will be at least 12 sections. So the table of contents is neither gremlins nor poltergeists, what the academics really want, what most academic advertising is, no, why most ac academic advertising is immoral bullshit. <laughs> On reading entrails and student evaluations, this is a great. This is a great name. Yeah, <laughs> this is yeah. really exciting. Did a good job. <laughs> <It's so excited>. yeah. <laughs> and then with the comment after, maybe maybe this is why the, the person in the next comment said they were excited because they read the content. So like, oh, this sounds good. And then okay, we'll get to that. <laughs> Grades communication breakdown. <laughs> And that, again, is on the comment because there was a communication breakdown from what that person was reading to how she graded it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with more language as a cover of self-interest, that, that's, that's an odd sentence. When moral language as a cover or is a cover, should it be is a cover or as a cover? I'm reading this from Barnes & Nobles. It should it be is like a cover. Should... When moral language as... is a cover for... It should be moral language. Right? Yeah, it, moral language is a cover for self-interest. Okay, uh, so uh, Barnes and Nobles. If you're if you're listening to this, maybe I'll send them a, a comment. Just like there seems to be a typo there. When moral language is a cover for self-interest, mm -hmm. then number seven, the general education hustle. Number eight, why universities produce too many PhDs. Number nine, cheaters, cheaters everywhere. Mm -hmm. Number ten, three big myths about what is plaguing higher education. And then number 11, answering the taxpayers. 
So that gives a general overview of, of what the actual content that we can look forward to in this series is. <laughs> now, <laughs> there's something I had thought of while I was looking up the actual <laughs> chapter list. I normally go on Goodreads to check out the different things about the books, and I was thinking, oh, let's read an actual review, like one of the each of the stars, five, four, three, two, one. And the, the initial comment here was something I read when you did the first read. I decided we're going to read it again here because it's just, it's, 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 it's good, as, as we'll see. Okay, this is from Tara B. Tara B. Uh, our full name is here, so I'm not doxing anyone. This is not a strike. that I, I just got a strike. Again, I mentioned this before. I need to get these things up independently. Okay, so anyway, this is the thing. Tara. This is what Tara says. I was expecting to adore this book, to cheer, to applaud, to enjoy the righteous rage. Then I moved through the stories that commenced the book. Oh, dear. is all like separate paragraphs, every sentence, <laughs> pretty much. White men trying to explain how women and scholars of color get an easy ride and white men are still disadvantaged. Throughout the book, <laughs> this story was funny as the first time I read it. <laughs> <laughs> throughout the book a series of straw men and then in parentheses three three <laughs> exclamation marks which i don't understand why she just put them on the straw men are assembled cheating student reviews tenure neoliberalism <laughs> and the writers showed shock slash horror that these situations are much more complex than explored by some scholars in higher education. Imagine some academics simplifying arguments or misconfiguring an analysis. I am stunned. Not. And this is what we left at. Because we were asking you again, what do you think the not thing is? I haven't looked it up yet. I probably will look it up and we're talking about it. It could have been The Simpsons. I think it might have been Borat. But we both remember saying that when we were kids. And it was something Barbara, in the 90s. It was like popular in like the early, mid-90s and shows. Yeah. That's all I remember. Yeah. <clears throat> and Tara here seems to be an, an older lady. She seems uh, white, like <laughs> could be lighter skin. So that's why I'm, I was I was using that accent. But there's, there's more she says here. And then uh, <laughs> the last sentence was, "Men mansplaining higher education." Yawn. These are not the droids you're looking for. Move along. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so you are not the droids you're looking for. That's that's a that's a line from um, from Star Trek. Star Wars, and get that mixed up. And I did it with one meme because I'm like, these are not the facts you're looking for. I just changed it out for that because that that's what happens in some situation. She read this book and got this observation from it. And Stephen, as as you said, you've only read three chapters. Mm -hmm. So Stephen is going to deign to mansplain to us and start mansplaining to us this book without even having read the actual thing. I haven't read it. So I shall also be black explaining to you white people what your white education system is like somehow. And <laughs> those are things that you can look forward to. Um, Stephen is one of those uneducated peasants that didn't even go to. He's not even one of those college educated voters and supporters of all the right things in society. So that will explain a lot of his boorishness and things like that. So, so those are, those are things that we can look forward to as we talk about this. But this is just the, the things you think about the content that you're listening to that we're going over here, and people are going to take it in a different way. Information is information. Yeah, we're just trying to present certain information and certain thoughts on it. We're not saying anything is absolute, and we encourage you and thank you for listening, of course, and we encourage you to interact with us and let us know things in the comment section and other ways. If you might have other thoughts and ideas, and also feel free to pick up the book and follow along with us as we go chapter by chapter. Anything else to add on this comment I, and other? I, I can I can dig it up for those interested, but there was sort of a, an equivalent review for cynical theories where it was something like that, like science is very sexist. I work as a woman in science, and I have to deal with all this sexism. These authors don't know what they're talking about. I don't know, like it just it reminds me of the same thing. It's like, okay, did you did we read the same book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, 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 there's some of the things. And um, this is one of the things that I'm going to be thinking of and going through this. And I also I think I, may, I mentioned this in the previous ones before we get into the actual breakdown of the first chapter here is one of my main ideas or thoughts with this conversation series, especially with this one about education that I'd, I'd like you to think of is whatever you personally do right now in your life that you consider productive. 
How did you learn about it? What are the main right. things that you learned about it? If somebody who does not know about it, be it a child, a five-year-old saying, no, oh, you're a fireman, or you this, or you that, and I like what you're doing, how can I do that? What would you tell that kid? If it's an adult, what would you tell that kid? If it's somebody about to go into higher education that's just finished K through 12 and is considering higher education to get into what you're doing or likes what you're doing, what would you ask them about, what would you tell them about learning, becoming who you are now and what you're doing now? Something productive. So not just like I said before, just oh, I walk around and punch people in the face. Even even with that, maybe you go to like UFC, like the the, the fight academy, and there's ways to do that. You're not going to go to higher education for that yeah. necessarily. But anyway, so um, how would you teach them that? And then if you have actually gone to higher education, what in higher education do you think was a key part of you being the productive person you are now, doing this productive thing now? And what are the things you thought hampered what you actually were able to do now. Now, those that's what I'd like to keep you to keep in mind as we go through the series and see if that changes from now and from the end when we've actually finished talking about this stuff. Sure. So, yeah. So I'll, I'll jump right in here then. So this first chapter is called Neither Gremlins Nor Poltergeist. Now, the reason they came up with this analogy is they're pushing back against what's called what people call conspiracy theory, the idea that all these problems are the result of some evil people pull behind the scenes pulling the strings. Of course, you want to take the extreme examples, lizard people, or you go in all right circles, it's the Jews. They like to say, oh, these people are behind the scenes controlling everything. Some people would say it's the Illuminati, et cetera, et cetera. They're making the case. No, no, this isn't the case. All these things in academia that we're seeing, they're the behavior – the behavior there you're seeing is the result of incentives, which is set up by the institutions themselves, and people are just acting them out accordingly. There's no conspiracy here, basically. And the the reason they picked gremlins and poltergeists is because gremlins are corporeal beings that are sort of destroying things physically, sabotaging all that. Whereas poltergeists are, of course, from the German noisy ghosts, spirits that are blowing through, disrupting things. You don't. You, you can't grab them, but they're sort of just flying through, disrupting, upsetting people and annoying things. And they're, they're trying to make the point that, no, neither of these are the case. It's incentives, rules, behaviors. They say here, big trends emerge from individual behavior without anyone running the show. Institutions create incentives and incentives determine behavior. Economics 101. So ultimately, that's all it is. Now, there are a lot of factors to look at. If you look at e each, each institution, all of the rules, who's acting – how how many people are acting, what they're all doing. Yeah, these things do become complicated, but I think if you break it down principle by principle, it makes a lot of sense. So any thoughts or comments on that? Yeah, and again, to reiterate, we're not saying this, most people are, are, most people are just people. People are just people yeah. who just live. But yeah. most people want to do good. Even if you are fully selfish, the most selfish thing you do, one of the most self-interested thing you can do is to be useful to as many people as possible so mm. they don't get rid of you. So they consider yeah. you valuable and support you. So the people who are doing things that might seem negative to you might seem harmful. Like I, that example I said with the kid in school getting the 15 minutes of, they're enjoying that. They're enjoying those 15 minutes. But because they have the 15 minutes of time with that teacher, it might prevent you from having 15 minutes with that teacher. Right. That doesn't mean that kid is evil. That kid is intentionally trying to harm you. That kid is trying to learn the most possible and get the time for the teacher. Now, when it comes into why does a teacher actually spend time talking to this kid over the other kid, maybe that kid reminds them of them when they were a kid, or yeah, maybe exactly. that kid thinks has some kind of special needs or communicates in a certain way, and that you don't, that they feel or assume oh, you don't need the extra help. I don't really understand this kid in a certain way, so I'm going to spend this. But that teacher is still making a decision to do that to best improve the actual life of this, mm. this kid. Now, right. there might be some separate things when you talk about things like the busing or the, um, what's it called, the um, segregation of schools. But even with that, as disagreeable as that whole concept might have been, most of the people involved in that were doing it because they felt that white kids learned different ways than black kids. So it was, mm. Black kids are just as smart as rich kids. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like that, right. Had that we had to kind of love with. When you say something like that, and you see that happening right now, a lot of people, activists right now, are saying, 
oh, we need to have separate black only spaces because there's a different way of learning, not just a different way of knowing between women and men. But they say, oh, black people learn in different places. We need extra attention for black people. We need right. them to be taught by certain people can only, are the only ones that can teach certain information to certain groups of people. Those things are coming from good places. I disagree with most of them, but I do understand different people learn in different ways. But yeah. that is why I'm arguing for using the current technology that we have to get it down to an individual level because it's not different classes of people it's different cases, different individuals within classes yeah. learn in different ways. So, yeah. Yeah. So the authors say here, I, I like how they sum up what the book is covering. They say universities' problems are deep and fundamental. Most academic marketing is semi-fraudulent. Rating is largely nonsense. Students don't learn or study much. Students cheat frequently. Liberal arts education fails because it presumes a false theory of learning. Professors and administrators waste students' money and time in order to line their own pockets. Everyone engages in self-righteous moral grandstanding to disguise their selfish cronyism. Professors pump out unemployable graduates into over oversaturated academic job markets for self-serving reasons and so on. So again, a as damning as what I just said was, we're still going to make the case. This is not being done out of malice. This is the result of the incentives set up by the institutions, which have all these negative externalities, which everyone else bears out. It's not like the professors and administrators are all colluding to make these bad things happen. Yeah. And this is a cascade thing. You know, yeah. one person makes a decision between two things and then two people base their decision based off of what that first person did. That might have been the less positive of the two options. Then two more people come and based off of those two people, then that's four decisions and it goes to 16. And then exponentially this grows over time and spreads out. And then you have entire institutions. Like yeah. when you're talking about institutional racism, institutional uh, police violence and things like this in the 1619 Project and critical yeah. theory, the idea of something being institutional is not what we're against. We are completely for that. That is part of why we're talking about this, but we're not saying it's inherently done that way for evil reasons, even if mm -hmm. we disagree with what it actually is. Uh, yes. So the short the short of it is that bad incentives explain bad behavior, and the authors have a few examples here. Which, as the book as we progress with going through the book, there's going to be more things like this. But just this just to sort of give you a foreshadowing of what we're going to be talking about. So the Jason he had a tough instance at his school where they had to hire a new professor, and they were torn between a man who was more qualified and a woman who was less qualified. Now. The provost was told by the upper administrators, look, we need more women and minorities. Our department is mostly white men. We need more diversity. We, we, we just need more diversity in the department. Now, the provost was stuck in a very tough spot here, and here's why. If he had hired the man, the department could be charged with what's called disparate impact. That is, you didn't specifically discriminate against anyone, but people can look at your department and say, you don't have enough minorities and women here, and then... That And then that shows some sort of institutional prejudice and you're working to keep minorities and women out. So that could open up a lawsuit that way. Now, the, the that was sort of the rock. Now, the hard place is that if they had hired the woman who was less qualified, that could they could actually be sued under for the well, for the reason that they're giving preferential treatment. Now, preferential treatment in line with the Civil Rights Act is only allowed if the university has an affirmative action plan in place, which they did not. So. If they had hired a less qualified woman, the man could say, well, wait a minute, I'm being turned down because of my sex, and then he could launch a lawsuit. So they were stuck in this really weird spot where, again, it's like, which way do you go? Now, what ended up happening in this scenario was that the man and woman were both offered the job. The man ended up taking it, and the woman turned it down. Now, so it worked out better for everyone because they got the more qualified candidate, and the woman just said, no, I'm not interested and went somewhere else. So – in the long run, it worked out well for everyone. But the concern is that the way the law is set up, it, it could have created this really tough situation, which could have, which could have caused problems, however it went. But but that's not the result of the university. It's the law creating those incentives. Any comments or yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah. yeah, two things based on this yeah. one. First of all, with just the law itself, this is more evidence yeah. that yeah. the law itself is at best a codification of some of the ethics of any given group. 
but it has almost nothing to do with morality. Like it's just it's just yeah. things that people kind of agree with. It does not define morality. So people should be like, oh, this law is this way. That's so horrible. Slavery was once once upon a time a one hundred percent legal in pretty much every system of law in the world. So that should that should disabuse you of that idea of connecting morality with the law. And then now when you talk about the specific laws here, what are schools about? What are educational institutions about? What do people decide? Why do they decide to go to certain schools versus other ones? What are people selling? What is the product that they're offering there? What we're talking about, what Stephen and I are focusing on, what we are for is the conveyance of information that somebody does not know to be known to somebody after someone is conveyed. And it's not a simple thing. We're, we're currently doing a re-recording of this actual thing right now. I've got some of my mind is thinking, was the first time I said this a better way? Can I say these kind of convey these things in a better way this time? We've been doing this conversation series. We're talking behind the scenes of how can we better do this? How can we make this to be something where, let alone, not only the information we're saying, but actually to get people to even sit down and actually decide to spend the time to even actually choose to listen to this. There's different ways you can do it. Do other languages. There's, there's all these kind of things. But when you talk about this, why is a school deciding between these two things, why are those things that they're worrying about actual legal, actual ramifications for, instead of literally saying, we are an institution that gives information to students, and we're worried that if the students find out that we decided to not hire the person, the mm -hmm. individual that was literally better at conveying information, they can sue us. That, to me, when you're an institution of learning, should be the only legal thing involved in that whole thing. That should be the only deciding factor. Is this person better at teaching? Then hire them. It shouldn't matter what they have between their legs. It shouldn't matter their XXXY chromosome, the kind of curliness of their hair, the accent they have, the, the, the number of limbs that work. It's, all these things should, shouldn't matter. They, they, you could you could have specific situations where maybe there's very specific things to that, but if that doesn't factor in, if, as you said, on whatever actual qualifications thing they had actually said when it comes to teaching itself, this one individual happens to be male, had been found, happens to be male, happens to be white, had been found to be better, I want an institution, I want a world where that's what decides why people are employed. Or if you have a situation where people decided to go with those affirmative action type of things, like companies and things have now, let them be open about it. And I'll go to the company and associate with the companies who are deciding it on merit that is completely directed to the product. Because you see that. And in the market, there might be some kind of way where there might be some benefit shown where if you just have social justice, human resource, like identity hiring type of things, there might be some hidden benefit that I am not aware of that might be able to be gotten by someone. So go ahead and do that. But I would, I'd rather just more information and be more open with that whole situation. But yeah. And the thing is, too, contrary to what Tara B. said in that comment, the author specifically said, we don't take a stance on affirmative action either way. They said, we're not saying, oh, they should have hired the woman because women are an oppressed class. They didn't say, no, we're mer we just want meritocracy hire the man. They said, we're not taking a position here. We're just laying out what are the incentives based on what the law is and how do universities have to deal with it? That's all they're saying. Yeah. And that's that's one of the weird things that happens with this that I'm trying to get a better understanding of is how people jump and conflate things as descriptive to prescriptive to applications. Like things are like information is what it is. Like the truth yeah. is what's true. It's not my truth. It's not Stephen's no. truth. It's not the author's truth. These are either true things. Like yeah. then the next reading is human action and it's gonna be a great reading. We're going chapter to chapter with that one. Where he's talking about with history. There is no opinions in history. <laughs> There's yeah. no editorializing in history. Something either historically happened or it did not happen. Yeah. So the kids are, they, you either have a university that literally has an affirmative action program that says out of a thousand students, only 600 can be white. And once you get to 600, even if there are more applicants who are qualified to enter your school, you have to stop letting them in and now let in 200 black people, and then you only limit it. There's 200 blacks, or let's say 100, to fit closer to the actual population, which is about 14% of the world, of the United States of America, even though most people seem to think it's a lot higher. Yeah. But um, So 14%, so let's say 15%. Let's give them the 15. And then you say, okay, 25% of that is has to be Latinos. So 250 Latinos, uh, 15, like 150 blacks, 
and then at most five like 50 Asian people. Even if you have a year where 200 Asian people apply to your school and they happen to be more qualified, higher grades on every single measurable for learning information, you have to limit it to 50. That is a literal description of discrimination. Yeah. That is not saying woe to the white man. That is just saying this is what is happening in this situation. That is a literal thing that could lead to say, okay, now it means... Because you had the selection of, let's say you had a, a wide range of 200 Asian people. You take the top 50 of the Asian people, and they happen to be a whole deviation higher than the average baseline to qualify. Then you say, okay, we're going to get the, we're going to fill the black people to 250. We have to get the, or we have to get the 150 people. So you'll get as many people close to the baseline, even if it's just like a regular, the regular, um, this, um, sorry, a regular distribution. Then you'll have a class where chances are, if the Asian is in the class, they are higher than average intelligence than most Asians. But then since you have a situation where you're just getting as many people close to that average of other groups, you'll get situations where there'll just be large groups of people who might not be able to actually keep up with the people. Then at the end, when you have disparate graduation rates between the different groups, things like that could explain it. Now, again, that is just... That is just comparing. That is just saying this is actual this data tower. We're not mansplaining. I'm not black explaining. Stephen is mansplaining. We're just talking about actual data. I don't know. Well, well, to your example too, you even have people like Ibram Kendi who said, if if you discriminate, it results in racial equity. That's positive discrimination. So there are some people who will even say this. <laughs> Yeah. Again, not 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 a fan of his. I've talked about him many times. Now I'm going to try not to keep bringing him up. But there are those who will also. But there are those who will take that position as well, that no, no, this is discrimination, but it's positive because it brings about equity. And then that gets a new, what is equity? Why is it a good thing? But again, the authors aren't making that case. They're just saying the laws set things up to establish these incentives. That's all they're saying. Again, what what you want to do with that information is up to you, but that's what they're saying. Yeah. Right. Might even be a step in a good direction because going from like black people can't be racist, but now saying like, oh, we're just positively racist. So at least (laughs) they're admitting that the ability is there. They're getting more, they're getting more features. They're getting more like uh, more ability. So that's good. Yeah. So another thing, and we'll get more into this in the next section, but about researchers being favored over teachers. Now, the reason for this is that research, it's better both for individual teachers as well as for the university itself. Think about it this way. If a researcher wins a Nobel Prize, that puts a big spotlight on the school. For example, where my brother went, SUNY Binghamton, they had a scientist who won a Nobel Prize. I think it was this year or last year. So people see that. That's going to bring prestige to the school. More students are going to enroll there. Uh, other good faculty will come there to work with that person, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, as far as for the scholar themselves, well, of course, they're going to have that prize on their record. That's going to open up opportunities for jobs. They're going to get book deals, et cetera, et cetera. So looking at it from those incentives, it makes sense. But then the other side of that equation is, well, students come there to learn. And if teachers spend more and more time researching, how much does that benefit the students in their education? And the students paying is what enables them to have jobs and all of the research to even take place. So there's sort of this tug of war, I think, between the teaching and researching where who does it benefit, why, and then how much time should they spend doing each. And again, the authors also make the point, we're not saying teachers should spend this much time doing research, this much time teaching, but we're, we're trying to lay out these are the incentives based on these dynamics. Any thoughts or comments? Yeah, yeah when you go into that, when you're talking about something like the research things or why does the name get out there, why is that more important versus just teaching? Is this a research institution or is it a teaching institution? Why should those two things be done at the same place? Is it possible to do both those things at the same level as two separate institutions that are focusing on those one things? Now, one of the things people point out is talking about sports. So why is this extracurricular? Why do, do why are the highest paid people in public schools and schools all around the United States of America the football coaches? Because that literally gets the name out there. These, you can probably literally follow more people that have decided to enroll in the University of Alabama from hearing the football team's name repeated over and over again on national broadcasts than you can for the different awards that they've won in the different institutions and different education departments. These things bring in this crazy amounts of revenue, but this is just the questions that, again, starting to ask, what is that institution primarily about? Is it a football school? 
or is it a school that has a football team? You know, so, so that's, that's the kind of thing that you start going into when you start questioning certain these things. These extracurriculars can be taught separately. I think it's possible for the University of Alabama football team to just leave the university itself, even just even if it maintains in the same location, but just separate itself. It's already an institution in and of itself, and have systems where you have that education system, but then you pull in. From saying like, okay, you're a student in this area. Anybody within who can qualify to play on the team can come, and then we'll pay you some kind of salary or some stipend to do whatever it is you're doing, whether it's education or whether it's a job and things like. That. So that kind of thing, when you come into that situation, those can be separated. So how many of these other extra extracurricular activities, if they're not sports? can also be removed because a lot of people will come down on sports, but then they'll say, oh, but we need we need X, Y, Z. We need these kind of general studies that I think we'll get into when we get to the general studies section here. The What's it called? The myth of general studies, is that called? The general ed hustle. Like a lot of those courses are just seemingly kind of pointless. Like why yeah. does somebody who's a biologist need to take just a general English course like Shakespeare? Yeah. It might in, it might enrich their mind and things like that, but why is that a something that they have to take in order to get that degree? Like you discussed with your culinary school, it was very specific. The courses you took were not the, this is directly cooking, but they were related to the actual field, right? Yeah, there were there were a few and, that you could debate on. Like I did take a, an English course, which again, it's it's not. I didn't find it particularly valuable, but it's not a huge deal. But most of the things, like the classroom classes, were things like product knowledge, uh, introduction to gastronomy, what else, nutrition. So they are things that relate to food. It's not, okay, like you say, reading Shakespeare, studying Latin or Greek, where it's, you're never going to use this in a kitchen. <laughs> yeah. 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 And for me, with my animation course, it was just, that one was about a year, a little bit over a year, and that was entirely just intensive, everything towards this the animation thing. Some basics of it to begin with, then you get in, you're just doing the practical thing, like you're running an animation studio in and of itself. And even in my higher education, the first couple of years that you take in the electives, and then once I started getting deeper into the graphic design stuff, it was all just graphic design stuff. It's a majority of that. And that, that, was, that was great. And even the final courses, the 300 level, 400 level courses, it gets to the point where it was like, okay, now you're doing specific ones. You're literally going out with clients and designing for clients and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I was thinking, you can have institutions coming together to enable that kind of interaction. But Everything else prior to that could be done remotely, could be done in other ways. I didn't necessarily have to be on site. And you're seeing that right now. A lot of universities are still demanding the students pay full tuition, and then they're actually quarantining them, quarantining them if they actually allow them on campus, saying you can't leave your dorms. Or they're saying you're going to teach you remotely, but you still have to pay $70,000 a year. It's like kids are starting, kids and parents are starting to be like, hey, what's, what's going on here? What exactly are we paying for here? That is so different that can't be done remotely. Yeah. And one one point I mentioned in her first recording, but it bears worth repeating. I and I don't think the authors were not saying nobody should go to college for anything. Let's be clear. There are certain things that you definitely do need a degree for. Obviously, doctors should go to school and all that. But the point is, people should at least re-examine. Okay, is it where do we need really a four-year curriculum? If you want to get a job at Geico as an office assistant starting or something, do you really need four years of school? You learn a few things that you never use. You remember a tiny fraction, then you're massively in debt and you're making like 40 K a year. Is that worth it? That those are the sort of questions we're asking. And I'll talk more about them, but that company Praxis that I still sort of follow, I've been in touch with, they're like an alternative to college. It's a boot camp apprenticeship type program. They've said similar things. I mean, I mean, the original founder, he has a master's degree, so he spent a lot of time in school, but he, he founded this in part as a reaction to, okay, I went to school, I spent all this money, a lot of the things these authors are criticizing, he'd probably say as well. And he felt like he wasn't getting his money's worth. So he wanted to offer an alternative. And he and other people associated with that program have said, we're not saying nobody go to college for anything, just consider your options. What do you you want to do something that specifically requires a lot of school? And it's worth it. Like my neighbor became a vet, she spent I think, like eight years in school. So and something like that. Yes, it's worth it. But again, if, if you're if you're not sure and you just pick something that sounds interesting, you get massively in debt and then you're not sure what to do. And then you sit by the phone waiting for a job. I don't really see how that's productive for you or for anyone else. So at least ask some of these questions to see if we can come up with a better way at very least. Yeah. And that's pretty much what we're trying to get at here where we're not saying, Oh, we just need to abolish the entire institution because as you mentioned earlier, we don't think you can just 
become a brain surgeon from watching YouTube videos. <laughs> we understand there's, there's very there's very specific reasons and very very good reasons of why you'd want in person learning on certain things. In fact, as I mentioned before, when you're talking about some some kid might have been in school and thought, okay, 15 minutes. And this is the thing: people who say kids learn better from in person interaction, and some people do. I, I can do this hermit life and I've adjusted to it, but I understand some people need that social interaction a lot more. And I also get benefits from when I do that. I know there's different ways to do that. But what is your argumentation that the current systems set up there are actually the best way for those kids who learn best in individual interactions? So we can't do that remotely, but somehow this kid who benefits from <laughs> face-to-face interaction with a human being to learn certain information you take them from remote where they can get personal time with a teacher on a separate kind of uh, discussion later on, or they're in the room by themselves and not, not having all these distractions. Now you put them in a classroom with all these other people in there speaking, taking up that time, yelling all these other fights and sounds. That's all of a sudden supposed to be a more conducive environment, or they have to go to like the teacher's office in this place in the hall. People know all the, spending all this extra time on the teacher. Yeah. There's, there's other additional things that happen in that environment. So some of the arguments that they make for that don't necessarily not that consistent, and they they kind of just for fall sure. apart when you start talking about some of them and going into the details. Yeah. Sure. So another instance they bring up, Jason and Phil, they make the point to say, look, we're not above corruption either. Something that happened with Jason is that he, they're, the professors are expected to – they have a certain budget they're allowed each semester. But the thing is they have to spend it by the time the year is up. They can't roll it over into next year and they don't get incent- – there are no incentives for being under budget. So what happens? The professors just spend all the money that they're given and – Jason admits he spent two thousand dollars on a standing desk that he didn't need. But I mean, hey, the money's there; he has access to it. So why is he not going to do it? He even said there are other things like professors will go to the nicer hotels, they'll eat in the nicer restaurants. Again, it's like why not? I mean, you're not going to get rewarded for saving the money; you can't roll it over. So there, there is that incentive where they're essentially being encouraged to spend that money and live high on the hog. Now, people can look at that and say, "Wait a minute! Couldn't that money be used for tuition? Couldn't that money?" be used to help the universe in other ways. Sure. But again, the, the way the incentives are set up, of course, people are going to do that. It's it's people are not just going to say, no, we're going to not spend the money for the good of the school. That's not that's not how people operate generally. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's the system. That's the way this thing yeah. is set up. And uh, we talked about the difference between people who say for profit schools versus, yeah. I guess, public schools. But yeah. there's the whole idea that profit is supposedly a negative thing. Yeah. Because as I just mentioned, people will say, you go to school because the socializing is part of the benefit. So that is something you profit from being in a school that you can't from being homeschooled by remote learning. That's what they say. So that's already part of it. So this whole idea that profit is just these people are trying to make money, that's that's absurd. But when you actually talk about the actual thing in economics, like when people make economical decisions, you're going to find different ways in a more free competitive market to find the cheapest possible way, most streamlined way to do that. So if you have extra money, you'll find a way to reinvest that and not have a situation where you're just being given money that's been taxed and people being redistributed, where you're worried. Because some of these people are, again, are good people. They're not doing this out of evil reasons. Like he didn't evilly want a standing desk. There could be very good reasons of why he got the standing desk. Yeah. But he could have just stood up on, like right now I'm just using like some kind of like bar stool. He could have just gotten something else cheaper. But you have a kind of situation where you're being told, let's do this. You're being told in a situation where also, if you let that money drop and you don't get that money next year, something might come up next year that you actually need that money for. But because it was dropped out of your budget, because they said, oh, you only, you need $100,000 less. So we will now not give you that money. So they'll next year when you need that money for actual something practical, something actually directly useful to the student, that won't be there. So there's also that kind of incentive. And that's something that happens a lot in the government. I know people who were hired and deployed by the government. They're good people. The system itself is not a good system in mm-hmm. general. It's based on taxation. <laughs> taxation is not a good system. Not a lot of the choice in that. It reduces the amount of competition, and competition is a very healthy thing that makes people invent and think about better ways of doing things. Like definitely look at the praxis and things like that are are why I'm, I'm also excited to be having this conversation because I think definitely. there's lots of brand ways to do things, and we're really going to take advantage of these new opportunities that we have. So yeah. 
And, and I think, too, uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but I think people just need to sort of get away from this romanticized view of academia. Like academics are not this special class of people that are somehow above self-interest. Same with politicians. Look, I mean, they have incentives, same as anyone else. They want to make money. They want to advance in their careers. They want fame. They want to open doors to better opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. It's, there's nothing wrong with that, though, that. The question is, whose expense does that come at? And are there negative externalities that are inflicted upon the students? Uh, again, people are not good or evil. Most people are a mix, but people are generally self-interested. And if people won't take that into consideration, I, I don't see how we can have a reasonable discussion on this because it just, it, it's like whoever you are, however indoctrinated you are, I don't see how you can't realize that these people are just as self-interested as, as anyone else. Again, I'm not knocking self-interest. I mean, I have objectivist ish leanings. I'm, I'm definitely sympathetic to rational self-interest, but why is there this attitude that somehow academics are above this? They do say all sorts of things about, oh, we care about the children, all that. But, but look, I, it, it's, they don't put their self-interest aside. And then of course, my argument is always something like, even if you were to get all these people who say, we're going to sacrifice for the good of the students, all that, you're not going to get an army of people that will do that, that will stick around forever. Even if you got a few people like that, they're going to leave, they're going to move on. In some cases, they may even be replaced. So there's this, this faith that we should just have that people will somehow self-sacrifice for others. It, it just, it's very naive. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a, there's an interesting thing about that where it seems to be one of those, those jobs that's, that's put on that higher pedestal. And there's, there's various reasons of why I think this could be happening. Yeah. Um, Part of it, part of it, I think, is also just as a kid, many of us, most of us have been through this kind of compulsory system or this kind of educational system where as a kid, you're growing up and then your parents and society tells you you have to go to this one location and be sent off there. M mainly your parents. I think there is a part as a child you have to somehow rationalize that my parents care about me as they do. Yeah. So they wouldn't send me to a place that's bad. So even if I go and the person there happens to be bad or certain things about that place happen to be bad, and even parents normally do this, they say, it's okay, you got to be at school, you should be at school. Like, I know you're crying now, I know you're worried, like, this is good, it's going to help you. So that whole thing happens. So you start at a young age. Yeah. Putting a good patina, putting, rationalizing on, and on, the, on, the, on, the, on the teachers, you put them in a certain light and you look at them as, as that kind of way. And for some, there's also the inverse where we're seeing again with uh, this kind of pandemic is some kids who are not in school anymore, there's some, some, some of them have a negative kind of home environment. There's stress yeah. now they go home, the parents have lost their jobs, maybe they spend a lot more time, it's not a good communication. So for some of them, it's also been that place where they go and it's been a release. A lot of people meet their friends there. A lot of people meet the people they're married to there. So this yeah. thing has been built in. So as you're growing up, you have a lot of reasons to make it seem or to rationalize it as a much more positive place. And slowly by slowly, you start building blinders to all the negative parts that might be in there. Because once you start realizing those negative parts, it leads to kind of a cascade of domino effect of questioning the other things that maintain this system and maintain this process. And that in and of itself can be tough. What, what do you think of that? And, and, I, and I, was go I was going to say, I, I've had that experience too, where I, I would complain about school and I get, oh, you just have a bad attitude. And that's like, well, what am I complaining about? And then it's, well, you have to do this. This is for your own good. It'll pay off. I, I mean, years later, I, I don't see my elementary and high school experience as being particularly valuable. Yes, I I'm glad I learned how to read and write, but I don't remember most of what was taught in that school. I've A lot of it I have no interest in picking up again. And for me, what I, I, I wonder sometimes in certain cases, if you teach very basic stuff, reading, writing, basic math, then would there be some way to sort of find from that point on, okay, what, what else could the kid be interested in? Where could we expand from that rather than just dump them into a one size fits all? You, you memorize a tiny fraction and you never use it again. And you spent all that time and energy when you could have either been working or learning things that you would end up using ultimately. And it, we'll get into this on the section about the general education, but you'll see the same thing. The students, again, uh, technically adults, we can get into a debate about how mature college students are, but they're saying, yeah. I'm studying all this stuff that I'm never going to use again, and why am I paying for this? And I, those, I look, those are very reasonable complaints as far as I'm concerned. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's it, it, it is a system, and I think it's, it's, it's not something simple to do. It's not just straightforward to teach something. No. You can even know something really well, but then when you go back and think, how could I teach this to someone who doesn't know anything about this who's somebody who's not even interested that 
much interest into it. And now that that improves when you go to something like culinary school, you go to the postgraduate like in design school, because in that one, somebody has made an active decision to come in and actually learn this. But the kind of decisions we try to assume, like, what about K through 12 education do you think in general prepares somebody to know what they want to do for the rest of their life to the point where they're willing to go tens of thousands of dollars, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars into debt mm-hmm. in order to dedicate themselves to that. What do people, what kind of idea of the mentality of that experience do they think encourages that? That's, that's a, that's a weird thing. Yeah. It, it just seems to be, that's just how things are. And it's like, again, it goes to that point of, if you're complaining about the status quo, you're saying we need new th- ideas. Well, again, why don't you apply that same reasoning in school? I, I can never get a concise answer on that. Yeah. And now, now the, the other aspect is this glorification. It seems to be some some kind of projection, some kind of some kind of weird thing. I, I, there's an example of right now. I think there's something with uh, Judge Comey Barrett is right now going through some some uh, interviews or some talks about going to the, uh, the the process of being approved for the Supreme Court of Justice, Supreme Supreme Court of the United States of America. And somebody was doing some commentary. Bill Whittle was doing some commentary where he's saying. They asked her about what she would do if she got in that position. What in her personal opinion? What what was her personal opinion if she if she came across something? Her personal feelings on something versus what she would do. And she said, "My personal feelings have nothing to do with it. If it's according to the Constitution, then I'll either have to say it's it's for the Constitution or not. Rule against it or for it." And the people seem to be incredulous of that. And that's part of that wondering where I kind of wonder. What do people think of certain people? Because you have people who are saying, oh, if you're in this field for this reason, you're in the private sector, you're for profit, you have this control, this power, you're going to be evil. You're going to be doing these negative things that are personally beneficial only to you. <coughs> Sorry. You okay? On the inverse, I think I just swallowed a, a moth there. Ah, horrible. On the inverse, they have a situation where they say, I have this group of people who are somehow special. These teachers, we're going to put them in a position of power over our kids. And somehow they are more, they are exempt, immune from that same thing that we say all these other group of people have, yeah. shouldn't have power over us. So what is the deciding factor? Go ahead. I'll be right back. I, I don't know if it's just, I, I think, I wonder sometimes if it's just the for profit thing. Like people have this idea that, Profit is just this bad thing that these are just evil money grubbing capitalists versus these are altruistic public servants, which, again, I reject that completely. It's like, yeah, you have you you serve yourself making money, but you also serve others. Again, you work in the school system like like that one person I think I mentioned earlier is a teacher and he openly says, yeah, I, I like my teacher's union. I get benefits. I get pension, all that. And of course, he's supporting a family now. So from his point of view, yeah, he's acting in his self-interest, which I don't knock. But again, it's whose expense does that come at? And that's where some of these issues start to come up. Yeah. <laughs> Still in my throat a bit. Okay. So yeah, let's keep going. So there was a book cited here written by Kevin Simler and Robin Hansen. It's called The Elephant in the Brain, written in 2018. They've, I, I haven't read this book personally, but it's basically written about how we're hardwired to deceive ourselves, how we we find ways to sort of justify our own behavior. I think that chapter later in the book will talk about this. I, I watched a very good video. Of, it was Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street, the real life guy talking about how he became corrupted. And the point he made is how when people become corrupted, it's not just like it's not you're a good person and you're bad the next day. It's you you incrementally approach this as oh, okay, I'll exaggerate about this price. Oh, I'll rip these people off a little bit. Oh, I'll rip these people off a little more. Oh, well, I'm just ripping off poor people. Okay, I'll go for rich people. Ah, they don't need all their money. Okay, I'll rip them off even more. And then you you just keep working your way more and more and you look at how you were versus when you started. It's You keep rationalizing things in your mind. And I think with some of these academics, it's a very similar thing. They keep finding ways to justify, oh, I'll spend a little more money. Oh, I'll neglect teaching a little bit. Oh, and then you you keep adding up, though, the cumulative effect of all these people doing all these things that, that contributes to the mess that we're criticizing. Yeah. And um, well, the one thing is, before, before we talk about it more, and it's also just a question for the people out there, people who are aware of tenure, what, what is your general idea of tenure? What do you think is, is, you think it's positive? You think it's negative? Are there any other fields or any other 
pastimes that you think would benefit from having tenure? Uh, it's just something that I uh, have some questions about. Sure. So the authors draw heavily from James Buchanan, who pioneered public choice theory. For those who don't know, public choice theory, it's a cross between political science and economics. It's meant to examine incentives institutions face and uh, the people in them face as well as far as how are we going to behave? What are the effects of our decisions? How do they affect other people? How do they impose costs on other people, et cetera, et cetera? I feel like public choice theory is one of those things that doesn't get enough attention. I know it's come under fire from certain people. Like, for example, Kimberly Crenshaw, the founder of Intersectionality, said some things critical of public choice theory. I think her criticisms are completely wrong. Now, she got her information from Nancy McLean, who Magnus wrote a critique of as well. Basically, she misrepresented a number of these economists. She got her facts wrong. She misquoted them. And I find there's the people criticizing public choice theory seem to have this general hostility towards analyzing institutions and understanding the way they work, especially public ed education. Kimberly Crenshaw mentions public education specifically. I have some theories about why there's this hostility. I think in part it has to do with it exposes a lot of the problems. It shows that maybe the solution is not just to put people like them in power and everything will be great. I think they see it as a threat. Honestly, again, that's sort of my amateur remote psychologizing, but that's I don't see any other cases because, again, it's like what's wrong with examining incentives in institutions and seeing how they perform? Uh, if anything, that's that's going to help us arrive at a better at a better understanding. And like my friend said, if you if if all the public choice theory is carried out and people understand all these things, bureaucracy is going to collapse. And then we would actually have a free market again because people would see this is not going to work. And I, I honestly think they feel threatened by that because their own positions would probably be threatened. Any thoughts on that or? Yeah, and this is the thing. If people don't do things they consider to not be valuable, like the people who are supporting these things are supporting them because they're valuable. So they're going to have reasons that are perfectly reasonable to them of why this is a system that is valuable. And once you start establishing those, you are going to start building up blocks to the things that would be considered detrimental. It's, it's a thing we all do in all our fields. If you consider it wrong, tell me, are you doing something right now that you don't consider positive and why are you doing that thing? Yeah. Chances are there's something you consider that would be worse if you don't do that thing, whether it's a worse option that you'd have to do or there's things connected, there's benefits from this negative thing that you're currently doing now, like supporting your family and kids. And for some of these people, they took certain degrees and we're yeah. going to get into this later on. Some of them, with what you've taught, the only thing to really to really actually be employed in <laughs> to gain that living wage. I think with that living wage term, like if you're not yeah. dead, if you're not literally dying, you, you're getting some kind of living wage. So, uh, but, but some people, they have to be employed in that system. That system itself is also an organism that grows itself, that kind of reproduces and says, let's continue on and on. So there's this momentum that goes on to this. I saw there was this one tweet and he posted a meme. Somebody was like, when you've spent something like $50,000 a, a semester or a year to get a gender studies degree or a critical theory degree. And then the president just bans critical theory from all the government institutions. Oh, yeah, I saw that, yeah. Stuck, like, uh, well, I mean, some people at the time when vehicles started coming out, they had just invested in horse and carriage, like stables and buying all this hay and buying a farm and making all these contracts and buying the wagon wheels. And then the Model T came about. And then your grandma was running around the Model T. Like, should, should we have said grandma? You came to Grandma Kirshner? <laughs> well, no, you said the name was different. On the, on your, was it the grandma side or the dad side? You so it's 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 my paternal grandmother, so her name was her maiden name is Mamolski, Polish. Okay. Yeah. So 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 little little, little last Mamolski <laughs> <laughs> or little last. I don't know, to, like, Nell, Nell is her first name. And and when was this? How long ago was this? Well, she was, was born like, in nineteen. She she was born in nineteen twenty two. So I, I I'm not sure the year it came out. I think of those cars in the nineteen twenties. So she would have been a little girl, but they were her parents would have been dri okay. driving those, so, or at least had access to them. <laughs> Imagine if you had an institution saying, like, no, you're a mosque because you cannot actually drive a vehicle. You have to actually just go on and keep riding those 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 wagons because so and so, Mr. Mr. So and so spent millions of dollars equivalent into buying this car. No, that doesn't happen. 
No. Think this is the way this is the way life happens. Sometimes yeah. you invest in something and then you decide it turns out to be wrong. You can yeah. you can recalibrate. You can find something else to do. Or sometimes yeah. it's just not as good as you thought it was going to be. That's that's just kind of the nature of life. We started this recording. We went through, it was pretty good. I think we'll get to the point now, to the point where it's like, okay, we finally noticed, I finally noticed that it hadn't been recording or something. But that was the thing, and then it, then we decided to do it again. We decided, let's restart the scene. This is, this is part of the joy of life. The fact that we make it through all these things is part of the positives, but sometimes critical theory... I mean, that's, and that's another thing. If they think critical theory is so important... Why don't they think they can just sell what they have to offer to yeah. the market, put it on the market, and it still have demand? Just because the president says a government official doesn't have to have it, it doesn't say a government official can't on their on their private time enroll themselves yeah. into this new institute of critical theory that this person and her friends now put together in their non-profit kind of way yeah. and somehow get people to do that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure. So they, th there should be a few questions that people should be asking. What incentives do the rules create? Who, who bears, who bears the costs of people's actions and choices? Who benefits and why are the rules the way they are? Those are quest four questions people should be asking. And ultimately, I would say, look, culture matters and ideas matter. These these are these ideas are what drives all these decisions. And again, if people I know when we criticize culture, we get into issues about, oh, you're being judgmental, cultural relativism, all that. But these are these things do matter. There's reasons different cultures excel in different areas. You can read Thomas Sowell's work from the last several decades if you want some good evidence on that. There are reasons that cultures excel in different areas. Now, does it have to do with attitudes, hard work, innate intelligence, some combination. Uh, yeah, I think all those things play, play a role, but it's worth examining what those things are because then if we can duplicate them, then other people will do better. Ultimately, we want to bring everyone up. That's the thing. It's not about putting people down for acting differently. It's about acknowledging what works or what ways we could improve and then implementing them accordingly. I think that's pretty fair. Huh. Yeah, it's... It's a, it's a strange way of how people look at things. Okay, those four questions, those are the four questions that you suggested or the authors the, uh, suggest? the authors suggest. Okay, with those ones, I shall be including those four questions at the bottom. You can remind me to do this as well. In the low bar or wherever I try to post this in the description, I'll try to include those as things the authors suggest. And they say you keep those in mind throughout the entire book, right? Or just this chapter. Well, well I, would, I would say throughout the entire book, but just in general, looking at you're looking at the university or even any system in general, just ask those questions. Okay. I think those are valuable. And with Thomas Sowell, I have this, the Soul three that, that I have is that merchandise with best selling merchandise of mine. But the, the Thomas Sowell three, I'm going to do two things on Sowell. It's um, he says, these are questions to ask about the economic left, but I think you can ask them about life. What solid proof do you have at what cost? And um, compared to what? Compared, compared to, to, what? to what? Yes. Yeah. So that's the thing. When you're talking about this educational system, what are you comparing the educational system to? What's the cost of it? Is it really fifty thousand dollars a year to learn critical theory, like, or just listen to our <laughs> multi-part series? <laughs> Who knows more after those kind of things? Or you pick up the book, Cynical Theories, and, and something like that. So that was compared to what at what cost? And again, I keep forgetting the last one. <laughs> compared to what so, at what I, cost? At what hard evidence do you have? Yeah. So what hard evidence do you have that this is the educational system that should be used for these things? So with that, but another good observation that Thomas Sowell has made and other people have made as well that you brought up here, and you recently posted about this, was what is the basic state of being? Like, you look at the universe, and for all it now we know, it's majority not life. So we should look and say, why is there life on Earth rather than why is there non-life? Because non-life is normal. So when people talk about, oh, why is there poverty? It's no, why is there wealth? Like, why do some people happen to have some? Because the base situation is poverty. The base state is non-existence. Why do certain things exist? Why did life exist? The base state is not why do some people have food and some people starve. The base state is starving. If you just wake up and you don't move, you will starve. Why do you have food to eat every day? It's because you've done certain actions. So I think that's, that's a weird thing that happens here. Instead of somebody saying, why... I should be provided a job. I should be provided a living wage. I should just have this critical theory. I should just study critical theory and I should just have a job. Why should anyone employ you? Yeah. 
in what you're doing with critical theory. Like the basic state is not having critical theory is a basic state of non critical theory not existing is the basic state of existence. So when somebody puts it together, the people we discuss and puts it together and says, as a university, I'm saying this is what you can come study here if you give me this amount of money and take this debt. The whole why involved in there, that's that's a whole proposition that you should ask, why should this be a thing? Why am I confident that this will actually be something in the future that is worthwhile me taking, not just the money, but money is just a representation of time, the time you've taken this. And part of me feels for this person. Is like With me, I, I studied graphic design. Um, I don't know if you mentioned when you were recording for it this time, how in the education system, when in school, like I know I could have studied more. I know I could have taken more advantage of the tools and things that we have. Because in some of these situations, sure, they spend a lot of money, but then they have access to all these computers. It's true, yeah. You can get all these programs. You can print all these things out. That when you leave, you don't actually get that much access to You have to pay for those stuff. And, yeah. and that's something that I think your average student, even if your average student that has a basic amount of time, most of them, it's some kind of, it's almost a, a, a gamble or bet on the parts of the institution where they're like, we get to spend these things, but we understand the, the kids for all these other distractions. They'd rather be out drinking and partying or just in their room studying one, fo- one focused thing. They're not going to actually use anywhere close to the amount of money that's actually put into the set, the resources that have already been spent and available to be used. People underuse those. So yeah. at least one suggestion, if you are in university, if you are in school, and you're already paying for this, these things, and you think you have to stay in, try to find ways to use the actual resources a lot more than you actually are, because chances are you're not using them anywhere close to as much. And I think most people who listen to this would also be in the camp of, they there's many things they could have used or would have used a lot more in retrospect yeah so i was just gonna make two points so with that post regarding poverty i feel like there were two people who commented who i feel like didn't fully understand what i meant by that they 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 kept looking at things in terms of comparative wealth what i'm trying to say that no mankind started in poverty and then one person said yeah if you go back to civil the beginning of civilization i said okay but the point i'm trying to make is that if you go what what what's considered poor what's considered wealthy changes depending on the time and place what's there's that whole thing about if you live in the US you're in the top 1% you mentioned that a lot in our videos Silas but also again it, people who are people who are considered poor now down down the road you know they're going to be considered very poor because the average life sta- li- the average standard of living is going to improve but if you look at people that are poor today in the US they're much wealthier than even peasants a few they're, sorry they're much wealthier than even kings 100, 200 years ago. So again, if you're talking about comparison, yeah, we can get into who has more money, who has less. But again, what what enables that quality of life? What enables all these goods and services? And I feel like this person I was sort of debating with, she just saw it as, oh, these people have more money than these people. That's bad. And I'm saying, no, no, you have to look at goods and services that, is, that are accessible. Like, I think most people would rather be lower class in the US today than rich in Austria 500 years ago. <laughs> I think it's objectively we you can't tell me somehow life was better for monarchs back then. It was either you were miserable or very miserable. <laughs> it's and it was well, again, yeah, we can get into who has more and why, we can get into general rational wealth and all that. But again, what is how do how does everyone's li- how do everyone's lives improve? It's not this is not something that just happens automatically. It's like they just see it as things just get better automatically and somehow people just have more than others. And I'm, I'm going to say that's completely wrong. And then yeah. the other thing I was going to sort of add on to with your example about the, the guy in diversity studies not finding work. I see this with actors a lot. Oh, I went to this acting school. I spent all this money. I can't find a job. Well, look, I mean, you're, at, you're in an industry that's intensely competitive. A lot of people want to become Hollywood stars. There's not going to be a place for everyone. There's only so much demand for actors. And what I find sort of funny about this, too, is think about how much time Americans spend watching TV and movies already. We can't just watch TV and movies all the time for the sake of giving these people star roles. Some people are going to be winners. Some people are going to be losers. That's, that's just how it is. It's, there's not going to be a star Hollywood role for everyone. Now, I realize that's disappointing for a lot of people to hear, but it's just the reality. And this is why a lot of people end up going into producing or directing or other things because they realize at some point it's not worth trying to be that star actor forever only to not make it. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and that that is that's interesting, and that's that's the it's the decisions that we make. Sometimes it, it turns out good. Sometimes it it, it um, 
sometimes it's suboptimal, so as yeah. to say the least. But yeah. So next up here, I'm going to go over seven big economic insights that uh, I think people should be using to examine this book, and just I think even in general. And I think when we do this section on human action, that's gonna these these are gonna come up more too. <clears throat> So number one, there are no free lunches. Trade-offs are everywhere. The most basic, important, and frequently evaded economic idea is that everything you do comes at the expense of everything you didn't do. For example, as we've been discussing, okay, time spent doing this is time that could be spent somewhere else. And of course, obviously, you see it with money and other resources as well. There are always number two is that there are always budget constraints. Consider this a corollary to the last point. American universities spend about half a trillion dollars each year, so it's a five hundred billion or half a trillion a year industry, depending on how you want to measure that or look at it. I should say. Incent number three is incentives matter. When when we want to predict or explain behavior, we should ask who benefits, who pays. If people are rewarded for doing something, they'll tend to do more of it. If they're punished or made to bear a cost, they'll tend to do less of it. If people can reap the benefits of something but push the cost on others, they'll tend to do so. Again, doesn't mean people are evil. It's just human nature. Four, the law of unintended consequences. When we pass a rule making a change or advocate a policy, we can say what we hope to accomplish, but we don't get to stipulate what we will actually accomplish in general. Almost every change brings unintended and unforeseen consequences. So, for example, if I open a factory in my backyard, if I blow smoke into the air, that, that could blow smoke into a neighbor's yard. They could inhale it. They could get cancer. Again, that's not something I was intending to do, but that's the law of unintended consequences. Number five, people often break the rules when they can, or in fancier language, people engage in strategic noncompliance. So that got into some of the issues I mentioned above about affirmative action and the civil rights and how, how do people get around those laws or at least try to. Number six, rules shape the incentives, which in turn affect how people perform their jobs, interact with one another, and use the scarce resources of their positions. Recall the example of Jason buying a standing desk. The university's rule meant that budgeted funds expired if they were not spent by the end of the fiscal year. Buying Jason a standing desk was not the best use of that $2,000. Perhaps that money could have been applied to tuition relief, applied towards upgrading the computer system in a classroom, or carried over into a future semester as a rainy day fund. The university's rules, though, constrained the way it could be spent, incentivizing Jason to buy superfluous office furniture. So again, back to incentives matter. And lastly, number seven is that good rules, good rules economize on virtue. Most people are neither devils nor saints. They sometimes do the noble thing, often the selfish thing, and sometimes do the wrong thing, even when it doesn't serve their interests. Sometimes when they act badly, they think they can get away with it, and other times because they're on autopilot and don't notice what they're doing. All right. Those are those seven rules. Again, I can send those to you if it's a little easier rather than memorizing what I just said. Any thoughts or comments on those? Yeah, no, it's it just again goes to show referring to human action again, when Mises indicates that, that economics is the youngest field of science. It is a specific field, and these things are not... It's not as common sense to think about these things. It, there's reasons why it took this long for that field to be developed, to get a situation where you have a culture and society where there's enough excess wealth and freedom of time to actually develop the arts, develop the sciences, develop economics, and have the time to sit back and ponder these things because you're not worrying about getting your head shot off or getting the lion down the street and munching your face off. Your kid is actually somewhat safe. You're, you have access. Your wife is okay or your husband is okay. So you have this situation where many things come together to create an environment where these people come up with this field and start thinking of these things. And that's also the inverse that happens with something like critical theory. You don't have critical theory coming up in some village in the Amazon because they don't have time for that stuff. There's a lot more practical things they're dealing about. Yeah. So some of the things might be more superfluous than others, but when it comes down to it, these are things that have come from this advanced society, from these positive things, from people spreading information, sharing information to the point where they connect enough things together to create enough of a human flourishing situation to have these benefits, to have these systems of schooling, to have people think like, oh, we're not complete as a human being unless we have a degree in this, or to have people value people's worth by the amount of degrees that they have after it. That's a ridiculous thing. Like, I don't care what educated voters voted about what. Like, educated yeah. on what? What yeah. does ha that have to do with anything? Like, should should we just have all the educated people in China vote for the United States of, in the United States election? 
because they're educated? Like, no, education in and of itself shouldn't decide anything. It's not the determinant of people's work. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into this. Things. We'll get into it later on, but that also gets into what are the standards for educated? What did they study? How far along are their critical thinking and reasoning skills? And then, how, how, again, how much of a measure is that even if they're qualified to make those decisions? Yeah. And this, it's, it's frustrating because yeah. I think if, if I was told to have somebody read and learn or have the entire world, because it's one of the questions that I thought before I decided, let's get into this Mises uh, Human Action as the next series, was if somebody was just given that book, would would they understand it? And this and this is uh, Stephen mentioned this in the end. I think in the last part of the of the critical theory thing, we were talking about which book would be best between uh, Human Action by Mises and Rothbard's uh, Man Economy and State. Mm-hmm. And Man Economy and State is written in a more in a more practical and more readable, um, easier to understand. Yeah. yeah. So if I had two books now that I would suggest that some the entire world could actually read in whatever language they would understand it would be first um first um man economy and state and power market and then human action they go over some of the same things but just the realizations and things that i'm learning from it is it's it's amazing stuff and these these seven economic or these seven things to think about i also have those listed below here these are not common sense no these are not intuitive things to think about now i don't know why they're not but they, they just aren't yeah. Yeah. All right. So a friend, a friend just sent me a message, which I, I'll actually read out because it's relevant to this discussion. He says, public choice theory is the answer to ex- intersectionality and systemic racism. The left says you can't, ha- you can have racism even if the people in the system aren't racist. Public choice theory says pretty much the same thing. You can have nothing but good people in government. It's still guaranteed to be a shit show. System- systemic racism is nothing more or left or less than the left recognizing a problem with government that is perfectly explained explained by public choice theory. So even even using even using their own arguments, this would still apply to government because it's like, you know, uh, again, the, the executive order is banning critical race theory specifically. I'm not against bias training and racial sensitivity training, as it's called, being taught in government. I think people should be taught to respect one another. It's this it's the ideology, which, again, we did a whole video series on if you want to hear it. Yeah. That's what we're objecting to. If you want to teach people to respect one another, you want rules against racial slurs, all that. I support that 100 percent. I think that that's great. But again, it's it's specific ideologies and let's not pretend like the people espousing the ideologies, they don't have their own agendas and self-interest either. Like I actually knew this guy a number of years ago who said, oh, there is no agenda. Oh, Obama just wanted to give everyone affordable health care. And it was like, well, wait a minute. I mean, did he want to get elected again? Does he does he want to be well liked? Does he want to go down positively? Does he want fame after? You know, it, it's like and again, I'm not knocking him for that. Like like, you know, he made money speaking and writing. He's able to buy a nice home, you know, good on him. But it's like we still have to factor in. He's still operating under those circumstances. And if if people can't acknowledge that, I, I don't know, like there's something preventing them from doing so. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's it's, yeah. An, it's an odd situation. That's, yeah. that's, it's the nature of the beast. You know, the gun yeah. is the gun. Yeah. Like a gun is just a tool. The government is just a tool. But yeah. the nature of the tool will attract people to that tool in a certain way. Yeah. Like there's many things the government does. Yeah, that can be done in other ways. Yeah. The few things that are specific to the state is its monopoly of violence over a given area. Yeah. So in general, if someone's like, I can help feed kids in many different ways, there's many other fields to do it. Mm-hmm. But if someone's like, I can decide what all the kids in this given area have to learn and have to eat, like Michelle Obama was going with her, her food plan, yeah. they have to eat this. Or organize an institution that says this is the food pyramid that we're going to feed based the way we grow food and feed children for de- for generations off of this if you want to be this the situation the place that says this is what we're going to demand everybody else to do, not sell to people but demand they do it mm-hmm. it's the state so it's going to attract the people who will recognize that what they can do can only be done or can best be done by using force it's not something that's actually they can sell to you. That in yeah. the actual competitive field, it doesn't actually turn out that well. Yeah. So they think if I can get into this tool that's called the state, into this vehicle, that's the way to do it. So that's that's our own issues. And that's, I think, part of the issues that I will probably be seeing with or have seen. And I think 
will be mentioned in this whole situation with the higher education system. That idea that you have to go through this. This is the only thing we can do in order to have this one thing that we all in general consider as positive, <clears throat> which is more human flourishing, more information, more education. And it, we'll get into it in the section about the oversaturated job market, but this is what happens. All these people study these things and are – well, it sort of runs in line with the fraudulent advertising, but they're told, oh, yes, you're going to make all this money. There will be a job waiting for you, all that. And no, there isn't. It's it's creating more supply than there is demand, and that's distorting the whole mechanism. I remember Stefan Molyneux talked about how his father got a PhD in geology, but a company said, we'll pay you to get your degree. Come work for us. For so many years and we you know well we'll help you pay for it you get a job all that so that's the pull versus the push there's demand for those workers so there's an incentive to train those people for that thing whereas with this it's people are just studying things that they find interesting and then hoping that there is a demand for them but again if supply outstrips the demand well you're going to get excess and then the value is going to plummet i mean that's supply and demand that's very basic economics huh. yeah yeah. And there's a tough thing. I think there are actually figures that show what percentage of Americans are actually employed in the field they actually studied in. I, yeah. I don't think it's that high. Um, I, I don't know if I would have studied graphic design in the way that I did, even though I had teachers that I consider were rather good at it. Um, knowing what I know now with the advancements, like something like with web design, I was like, oh, I don't really like web design. It seems impractical. But then now it's like mm-hmm. anybody can create a website multiple times better, exponentially better than the top kind of design I learned on when I was taking it as my undergrad, just because of the changes in technology, you can just go on and just put something together on the random websites that they have there for, for free. So it's, it's kind of like, should I be like, no, these, these sites are not allowed to exist because I need to be employed as a graphic designer because I spent this much time and money into it. No, you, you can't do these things. Yeah. So... Business business ethics uses philosophy, management theory, sociology, economics, and moral psychology. That's what this book is intending to do. And then the authors end this chapter with six different questions about business ethics. Three are normative, three are descriptive. So the the normative questions are: to whom is an organization uh, who to whom is an organization business responsible? Whose interests must it serve? Number two is: what moral limits do organizations face in pursuit of their goals? Number three, whom should organizations hire and how should they treat employees, customers, suppliers, and others who have a stake in the organization? Number four is what is what do individual employees owe the organization and society as a whole? So sorry, that was four, not uh, three. But and then so basically questions of morality as far as what what like you know how should the business operate? Who owes who? What should the business do? All that. And then there's three descriptive business questions. Why do people in an organization sometimes act unethically? What explains how they make decisions about right and wrong? What physical, mental, organizational, or budget constraints do individuals and organizations face? And then number three is how can we use the answers to these last six questions to produce better behavior? I I think those are great questions to ask. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, lot, it's a lot of things. I'll send, me as well. I'll, I'll, I'll send you all these questions because it's a lot and they're rattling off, I know. And then yeah. one other final point they make at the end of the chapter is they talk about, again, they don't want to take an ideological position because there are criticisms the left and the right make of each other in academia. Of course, obviously, we criticize things like critical theory, intersectionality, all these classes are just indoctrination. But then what the left is more critical of is the for-profit thing. And they would actually sympathize with some of these criticisms as far as where does that money go? How is it spent? Do professors live very well? Student debt crisis? So they all do have valid criticisms. But again, this isn't taking a particular side. It's trying to look at all these issues together. And it's my hope that people who would read this and would also listen to these videos that they would find they would find value in all of these arguments, to wh- whichever side they may be on. Yeah. All right. So that, that's the end of chapter one. Any concluding thoughts or ideas or anything? No, it's it, it's just. I mean, it, it it looks like it's a good decision to to actually get into the series. It looks like it's going to be an interesting series to get into mm-hmm. different topics, and I think we'll be interspersing this with offering certain ideas and possibilities and other ideas. I said that twice, <laughs> and other other ways of learning that we might have thought of or different improvements. Like the same question I asked at the start. What, what was the system? What do you think was good about the word or the way you actually learned? And I just checked over here. It said 
about three in ten, thirty percent of the people are actually employed in what they actually studied. Yeah. Yet you have something saying eighty-two percent of college grads believe their bachelor's degree was a good investment. They're mostly ch- change do this one change. The clickbait thing. I don't know what the change is saying. Maybe the cost of it. I don't know. Uh, what not is more completing an undergraduate. Regrets about college majors. Around sixty-one percent of these polled say they would look back and change their major. People. So yes, yeah, so they said they would look back and change their major, but they're still saying it was a good investment. Uh, around twenty six. Okay, around twenty six percent of degree holders said they would change their majors to pursue their passions. What does that even mean? Yeah, exactly. Twenty five percent said they would change their majors for better job opportunities. You see, those passions people, many of them are probably employed in a field that is not the one they actually invested all that time yeah. and money in. So now they think somehow if they went back and were found some kind of job thing that was in what they're passionate about now, they somehow think they would have been better. But then why wouldn't it just work the same way and the same way they studied something and didn't actually get a job in that? Maybe if they actually went and studied this thing they're passionate about right now, they would have gone through some kind of system and gotten diluted where their first job that they tried to get in that field was so low level and they were so not ready mentally and had different expectations of it that were brought up by being gassed up in college that they would have been deluded with it and gone somewhere else. Yeah. Part of the reason they might have been so passionate about what they're doing now that they think, oh, if I had studied this back then, could be because they became disillusioned with all these other things they studied. And as an adult, with a more accurate idea of what society is, of value, and the different profits you get, not just from the paycheck, but the day-to-day work-life balance that people say, um, they were able to make that decision as an older, more... <laughs> aware and more informed individual to get into something that they're passionate. So their 16, 15, 17 year old self becoming a freshman and it's normally 17, 18, right? Becoming a freshman in college and choosing your degree at that time, that kid is not the same, didn't have the same passions. And maybe some people will have a mentality where they had the same exact passions. I guess I was I really liked art back then and I still do now. So there could be some things there. But just my general thoughts about that whole idea, it seems to be a discrepancy there. People believe, 82% of college grads believe their bachelor's degree was a good investment, but then they say, most could change this, that's a caveat there. But only 30% are employed in their actual thing they, they, they studied. Yeah. So they seem to be a discrepancy there <laughs> between those two numbers. Well, and this also, we'll get into this, I think maybe in the next, I think it's the second or third chapter, but where they talk about how a lot of students want the degree more for the signaling it has. It's, oh, you have a Harvard degree. All these people see it and they're going to want to interview, maybe hire you. Whereas, but it's not, oh, I learned some secrets at Harvard, which made me so successful. No, it's, it's that signaling too. And again, we'll get into that in that other chapter, but I think that says a lot too, because then it has, you ask the question, if, if there was some other way to send a signal, but at a fraction of the price and time, would that be a yeah. better alternative? And that's one of the things that Praxis was trying to do as well. Yeah, maybe that's what they're connected to. It's like maybe 50% of these people met the person they're married to in college. So when they look back at that, they consider that bachelor's to be part of that investment into the bachelor's degree. They're tying that in together and not focusing solely on the information, which is what I think me and Stephen are both mainly focusing on when we're talking about our objections to the school system is if, if the main purpose is education is imparting information i don't think we're doing the best we can i think we can do a lot better yeah all right so that's all i have for now i think that went well yeah okay so i think we are going to cut off now as we did a previous hour of recording before this and now we've done another two hours almost uh we'll say bye here and steven you can stay on after we finish off the talk but for everybody else listening thank you Welcome to this series. I hope you're enjoying it so far. I'm enjoying this double recording type of thing, but try to avoid that next time. Let us know. And as I mentioned, uh, Stephen, you're going to send me those things. Those questions and things will be here below. I'll also have a separate blog post with those to refer to them because these are things to keep in mind as we go through this series. And I think from what you just listed, they're also helpful in other sectors of your life. Mm, Definitely. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for listening.